Welcome to Bread and Roses, everyone. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the calamity that is Donald Trump and insane fatwa on stopping natural disasters. Who knew that was possible? And the slice of life is about Afghan refugees bowling over a French town with their cricket. Interview this week on Bread and Roses is with Caroline Fauré on the second anniversary of the attack on Charlie Hebdo and freedom of expression. You don't want to miss this program. Stay with us. Well, we all know that Trump is now the president of the United States. I find it really difficult to say. I mean, not that all the other presidents were so wonderful, but because I think Trump represents the sort of naked really, we can say, barbarity of the religious right now being imposed on the United States. This is something that we've seen over decades in the Middle East and North Africa, and people were very critical sometimes of us comparing the religious rights together, saying, oh, you can't compare the Islamic right with the Hindu right, with the Christian right. But now, you know, the point we made was when it has power, the, mm. the situation for people is so bleak. And we're seeing that one after another with Trump's executive orders. And executive orders are very clearly, you know, anti-woman, you know, anti-environmental sort of protection, uh, anti-undocumented and migration and refugees, you know, anti-working class. The wall, it's a symbol of the American sort of uh, ruling elite against the working people of America. And the consequences, the first line of people who actually suffer from Trump would be people of America. And we need to recognize. And also, this is a new, although we've had the right wing in the, in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, wrapped through religion and the religious right movement and the Islamic fascist movement, we'll see the other side of the coin, which is the taking power of the religious right in America. And I think these are the same, you know, different sides of the same coin. And look, I mean, you know, it's you, you can now start seeing the real comparisons for people who might have thought that argument was very abstract. Now you have journalists being arrested hmm. in America for covering certain issues. You have, uh, you know, the president saying that torture is something that's great. It works where we know that torture doesn't work. And even if it did, it's a you know, it's a fundamental human rights violation. And the fact that, you know, it's scapegoating and blaming refugees who are the victims of US militarism, but as well as Islamism, who are trying to flee, you know, trying to prevent them. And it's sort of, you know, all those people who are for Muslim profiling, who are for closed borders, well, this is what you get. Yes, that's exactly you, what it is. This is exactly what you've now been given. No, I, I hope I, you're I, enjoying it. I think that that's the thing, that's the issue is, that we need to recognize this is it has the hallmark of the right wing bordering on fascism um, in, in power even the style and the way the journalism and media um, has been treated um, it's, it's just the hallmark of that fascist, fascist movement that it stops people hearing the news that you always have this fake news you have this post-truth the reality is what the you know, the leader says and everything, everything else is untrue. Anything is not in his favor is untrue. And, yeah. you know, even the basic voting system, he's, you know, Donald Trump is questioning the fact that he lost the popular vote in the United States. And this is a nightmare that we need to recognize is a reality and it needs to be stopped. Yeah, and, I mean, it's know. the complete subversion of truth, isn't it? Truth is inconsequential now. And that's the same thing that we've seen with the Islamists for many decades. Now it's the same in the United States. Doesn't matter what's true, doesn't matter what's fact. The Donald decides that. Yes, yeah. and the interesting uh, thing is that the, the resistance and uh, people opposing this, um, it, it's a beginning. I think it started very uh, clearly. The Women's March in the United States and Washington and many different cities of America across Europe and different cities started that was a great boost. But you, we've got to recognize that to oppose the religious right wing in power in America, you can't court the religious right wing of Middle East, North Africa. Yeah, I mean, one of the realities is that Trump is using white identity politics to a large extent, the sort of white nationalist politics, which is 
really also identity politics. So if the women's rights movement, for example, if we look at the, the wonderful women's march that took place in many countries across the world, if that's going to use identity politics as well, it's going to fail because it's the same regressive politics. Yeah. The way out is to go back to real fundamental left politics that puts people at the center, that puts human beings at the center, citizenship at the center, irrespective of one's so-called identity, real or imagined, and also to start organizing around political ideals and principles rather than, you know, is your identity black enough, yeah. woman enough, whatever enough to fit here, and on the other side, is it white enough to fit there? That's a failure through and through, and we're mm. seeing its repercussions Absolutely. now. Absolutely, and we? I think, uh, you know, while the... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the dizziness or initial dizziness of Donald Trump and Brexit to some extent and the rise of the right wing, it might have a you know, very short term effect. But the reality is that people have started to uh, recognize this is, uh, uh, is going to be extremely harsh and people need to resist it and oppose it. And we've seen that, for example, in Britain, majority of people now um, oppose Brexit because they recognize that the um, you know, it has a serious de detrimental effect on the life of people of Britain, and that needs to be uh, clearly stated. Brexit, uh, Trump, and the right wing in Europe, they are the other side of the coin of the right wing religious movement in Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, and We've I seen for many, many well. years. Yeah. I want to add one more thing as well, and the, the fact is, you know, that this whole politics of the religious right, whether it's Trump or the Islamists, is based on fear and, and scaremongering. People are really afraid now. I mean, we're having a conference in July, and there are atheists from uh, Muslim backgrounds who want to come. To, to speak at the conference who are now afraid to leave the US uh, lest they not be allowed to return back. People like my family are afraid now. Who knows what's going to happen to them because they've, there's this anti-Muslim sort of sentiment, anti-migrant sentiment. The other side of it, the resistance has to be one that gives hope, that tries to break that barrier of scaremongering and hate. And you can't do that again with yeah. the politics of regress regressive identity politics. It has to be one. Yeah. Universal of, standard, exactly. universal identity, universal values are key. Any and movement. Com common humanity. Yeah, that's, that's what we need to push forward. Migrant, undocumented, citizen, white, black, yellow, brown, green. We are human beings. Are our lives are interspersed with each other, they're linked with each other, and we need to fight together the religious light right in all of its sort of components, whether it's Trump, whether it's ISIS or the Iranian regime. Yeah. Last week, Caroline Fouret, who is a French secularist author, filmmaker, she was here in London to take part in an event organized by the National Secular Society at the British Parliament on the second anniversary of Charlie Hebdo and the attack on freedom of expression. And so I had this chance to meet up with her and to interview her for this program and to talk to her about really this, you know, what Charlie Hebdo represents, uh, both in the form of the attack on free expression, but also in the form of resistance, which I think Charlie Hebdo is very much part of. Absolutely, and this is this is all linked. This is all linked with what's going on. So I think Caroline sort of uh, points about you can't compromise on certain values. You can't, you know, and there are points. There are, there are points in history of you know, uh, defending freedom of expression and basic values, progressive values that you have to stand and shouldn't give any grounds. You can't say, um, you know, you, you believe in freedom of expression, but mm. you can't say, yes, they're wrong to attack Charlie Hebdo, but. but any of those buts are dangerous and they need to be, you know, challenged. And I think that's the lesson of Charlie Hebdo, who's never given up yeah. on defending uh, freedom of expression. And, and this is so valuable in this day and age of Trump and the right-wing attack in Europe, uh, in the Middle East, North Africa, in America. It's an important standard we need to keep. Yeah, and one of the things is that the reality is that there are so many people across the world whose freedom of expression is being denied. And at least for those who live in Europe where there is some freedoms, uh, you know, that you, you have 
guaranteed that you can speak out that it's important to do that in order to open the space, break taboos, so it makes it easier for people elsewhere to do it as well. And people will feel hope and solidarity when they see people standing up for the right to express views, even that you find uncomfortable. I mean, the reality is, especially when it comes to religion, it's got this, you know, feeling of being sacred, you can't touch it, you don't want to offend. But that's really the crux of freedom of expression. If you can't offend, if you can't touch things that are taboo, freedom of expression is really meaningless. Mm. And therefore, what Charlie Hebdo does is hugely important. And I think the other point that Caroline made, which I think is very important, is the fact that, look, if you start making excuses and add buts to things, you're helping and encouraging a, a movement that is encouraged by some saying, well, maybe they have a yeah. point, the killers have a point. And, you know, we have to come out and say the killers never have a point. People must be allowed to express themselves in any way they want. Carolyn for it, it's such a pleasure to have you here on our program. I wanted to ask you about Charlie Hebdo. It's the second anniversary of the massacre. Mm -hmm. To you, what does the massacre symbolize and also the opposition to the massacre, the resistance to it? It means that we have to continue the fights that uh, we start all together, but now we are missing them so much. We are missing them because uh, not only they were friends, because we are missing also their talent, their humor, their kindness, their genius, really. Those, those guys were so talented. It's very hard to continue to see the actuality, this uh, horrible actuality that we've got every day without those drawings and cartoons who help us in France a lot to have some distance with it. But the worst part is definitely to continue to hear um, those stupid comments, um, this propaganda, this aggressive or, or, or really those lies about who they were, what was Charlie Hebdo, what is Charlie Hebdo still today. This is really becoming painful and more and more painful because before the massacre, people they had some excuses. Uh, it was already f hard for me to, uh, all the time, having to repeat that no, Charlie Hebdo is definitely not a racist newspaper, to explain why we decided to show those drawings about Mohammed after the Danish uh, cartoons controversy. But when the massacre occurred, and we had maybe one week of relief uh, from those accusation and then it started again but they became more and more unbearable I mean it was really becoming hard to stay quiet and to say but what are you doing what are you saying do you say that we have to blame the victim for what happened to them do we say that there is any sense any logic in what those killers did because you have to understand and suddenly so then I, I realize that people who want to to be very kind, be politically correct, to, in the name of respecting everyone, to not offend anyone, they do not realize that those groups are very political, that those killers are very political. They are doing it because they think there will be some fool, fool to clap, of course, but not only there will be some fool inside the democracy who will say exactly that. Okay, it's sad, of course we are against the violence, but still, they should not have done it. And until the last one who is going to say it, they're going to kill people because they want to obtain that effect. So I'm really, I have, I'm trying to stay patient with those people, but really they need to be responsible. They are accusing, they are accusing us, the secularists, the feminists, the people who are defending their own liberty to be free to speak to be not responsible, but in fact, they are not responsible, not at all, by blaming us. This is part of the Islamist project though, isn't it? Always blaming mm -hmm. the victim, and you've got people in the West who completely support their position. And as you say, you know, the fact that people can justify murder for cartoons is unbelievable. What would you say to people who have that perspective? And of course, they will never say, I justify the killing, never. They will just say, I support Charlie Hebdo, but uh, uh, I support freedom of expression, but um, they should not have done it. Without thinking of the situation where we are, 
the situation where actually the first who did offend everyone is the fanatic. I mean, they, they did offend uh, the women's right, they did offend uh, the gay, they did offend the Jew, they did offend almost every Muslims who are not like them. Um, then people just try to react by continue to speak, uh, continue to laugh. Then they want to kill them and then we say, but because they are offended. This is nonsense. Uh, but when it goes to journalists, this is where I'm more... I mean, there is people who are far from those subjects and, and they should stop to be so far because it's concerning all of us. But when it goes to journalists, where their own job is to put a drama in perspective and to analyze the context of what is happening, I think it's really more dramatic and even more irresponsible to to do just a TV show, for example, where you, you give five minutes for the Democrats and five minutes for the anti-Democrats, pro-fanatics, and say, well, I done my job, I did offend no one, and I can move to another subject. This is this is really, this is dangerous, actually. So when Charlie Hebdo had decided to support, for example, the Danish newspaper, we've been under death threat for just having this um, 12 cartoons about illustrating Mohammed. Um, at Charlie Hebdo, we didn't think we have the luxury of saying, no, we're going to choose another actuality. No, we, we, Charlie Hebdo is a satirical leftist newspaper with drawing all the time every symbol of religion. And when this, this huge worldwide polemic occurred, we had, we had, of course, a discussion. We say, okay, can we look in the other way? Can we not show first the drawings who are in the center of the polemic? It's like not quoting Salman Rushdie when he's under death threat. Can we do that? Uh, we are journalists. And secondly, we need to add our own drawings because we want to mean something with very... We were, actually, we were obsessed by the fact of not being racist. We were obsessed with that. So when we choose to draw Mohammed on the side of the Democrats and not on the side of the fanatics, we're actually saying it's really hard to be loved by assholes. It was in this anti-racist perspective. Now, when you want to remind that to the people who are saying, yes, but Charlie Hebdo was racist, without knowing at all a clue about the newspaper, when you just want to show the image to explain to it, you are censored in the British channels and the American channels. I mean, it's crazy. It's completely crazy. This is democracy killing democracy. What would you say, though, to people who say that you don't need to show a cartoon of Muhammad in order to have a proper discussion? Why offend unnecessarily? <laughs> this is the beginning of... You can censor everything with that type of thinking. I mean, if the limit to freedom of expression, and I think there is some limits. For me, incitement to hatred and killing is a limit. And when uh, some religious association did sue us, We've been under on trial. I mean, it's fair enough. And we could, we had the possibility to explain ourselves and the trial uh, clearly decided and judged that there were absolutely no racist ha hate intention behind that. It was really, really to illustrate the fanatism going on and to, to show the difference between uh, some fanatics and some religious guy. But we if we decided that the limit is that someone is offended, but then democracy offends the authoritarian. In Turkish, in Turkey today, uh, the fact that there is Kurdish journalists offend Erdogan, so we stop them and we don't support them. Um, the fact that there is um, free women offend the machism, then we stop to be free women because it's offending sexist. I mean, this is nonsense, absolutely nonsense. But of course, even those who have this very sophisticated um, point are not telling you the truth. They're not telling what really they are standing for. They are not standing for being reasonable. They are just cowards. They just, they cannot say, but they are just afraid of what can happen if they are too brave on that. And I can understand it. Honestly, I can. But we're just asking them to be honest and, and say so. I don't blame the Elon Poston, for example, when you know, my, my colleagues are dead because they draw to support the Elon Poston and the Danish cartoons. 
when the massacre occurred, the, the Yellen Poston didn't want to draw to support uh, Charlie Hebdo because they were just too afraid, because the, the security costed them too much, they lost too much already. But at least they can do it if they say so. We are too afraid. Then you don't reverse uh, the reality, you don't blame the victim, you're just saying the truth. Why do you think it's important to draw Muhammad or make fun of what's considered sacred and taboo? Because it is the only way to not being uh, under the rules of the most uh, fanatics. Uh, blasphemy has always been, in, um, especially in modern and secular society, and especially in France, we have this tradition, our way to not be under authoritarian uh, domination. When, if there is only the religion that you cannot laugh about, but you can laugh about any other ideas, that means that religion is above all. That means the religion is a sacred, sacred political reference. Um, but well, I would understand that all the people who want to dominate the other will go to this camp because if it is the only camp you cannot criticize, it's it's pretty cool. I mean, but it's just the beginning of the end of democracy. That's it. So, of course, we have to defend the fact that there is no one system of value or ideas with, by nature, above all. But more than that, um, and again, the Danish cartoons were well, not even to mock Mohammed. It was just to show Mohammed because there were no single cartoonist in Denmark who wanted to illustrate a positive album about the life of Mohammed. But still, yes, we need to laugh about Mohammed, as we need to laugh about Jesus and all of this, and Che Guevara and everybody, because they are, they are powerful symbols used by human beings to oppress or convince other human beings. If you cannot say, I do disagree with your way to impose me your ideas, that means we are already under a theocracy, under a a dictatorship. So, if we are still a bit Democrats, we need to love a lot. Two final questions. Don't you worry sometimes because of the far right and racism that it exists uh, on how you know cartoons can be used in favor of the far right? I do not worry sometimes. I do worry all the time. And when we did uh, the publication of the cartoons uh, about Mohammed, we were thinking about that all the time. And I didn't change my mind about the fact that the best way to resist to the alternative or the temptation of embracing the far right is to have a very clear and secularist left who is brave enough to defend those principles who are just the base of progressism, freedom of expression, uh, having the right to do blasphemy, and secularism are just the base of the progressive ideas. If the left desert them, don't be surprised that people are going conservative and more than that, that they're becoming sometimes racist and xenophobic. And my hope today is that because we have a Charlie Hebdo left in France, we will avoid a Trump right. I don't know yet if we're going to succeed, but we paid a little the price to say to the far right, you're not the victim of the fanatics we are. You're not the target of the fanatics we are, because we are defending those values that you're just using to be elected, but yet you don't truly believe in it. Um, my final question to you is, what do you see you know, uh, as the sort of main battle ground, or main, um, what do you see as the main areas of fight back for free expression, for secularism, not just in Europe, but globally as well? I will... There is this double fight. I mean, again, uh, changing, for example, all the left in Europe, because except France today, I mean, the, the English left, the, 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 the Belgian left, the Swiss left, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. It's a regressive left. We're supporting the Islamists, we're supporting the misogynists, the homophobic, the anti-Semitic, against the, against the ex-Muslims, against the, all of us. Um, so the first big step is that we have to change that. We have to elect a very, very progressist, secularist left everywhere in Europe. And also there is a big challenge in university because we have a misinterpretation, we have a, 
a wrong idea is also about what is a democracy. A democracy is not to give five minutes again for the Democrats and five minutes for the anti-Democrats, not only in the media and the TV show, but also sometimes in university, where it is the place where you're supposed to learn critical spirit and a certain guideline to think. We know that we are in a world of the post-truth, that where there is a lot of propaganda going on, that there are states who want to use that propaganda to confuse the Democrats and to put them in the arms of the authoritarian. If we want to stop that, we need university who is going to help the new generation to think clearly through that. And thinking clearly is definitely not having all the time as guest, preacher of eight, Islamist in the name of uh, respecting culture, in the name of this stupid relativism, and not having clear voice um, or trying to teach again um, how to defend those values, uh, because we all know, and you know it, Mayam, and we have all these experiences, that when we, us, us, the Democrats, the secularist Democrats, when we go to a university today to speak about Charlie Hebdo or freedom of expression of blasphemy, we have troubles, we need police protection, we have people who are coming and insulting us, intimidating us. When the authoritarian go in a university, he is facing no <laughs> those type of problem. He do not need a police protection. So this is the responsibility of the heads of the university to think what is the mission for their temple of education for the new generation. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. The insane fatwa this week is from Iran, and it's a very, very important fatwa. I think Trump's uh, men should listen in it because it's, they could get some advice here. And it is the head of the crisis management uh, department that deals with natural disasters. He has signed a statement with the seminary in Qom, which is the main religious seminary, about stopping natural disasters. Now. Who knew that you could stop natural disasters by signing statements with religious seminaries? And this guy is in charge mm. of, this guy is in managing charge of crisis. managing crisis, and he's gone and signed a declaration of, and joined declaration, and he That's said we're going right. to do this with every other city's religious sem seminaries as well. This is just like, and, and it's the idea that you know it's because of immorality, of course, that there are earthquakes and that there are tsunamis. If people were more moral, like they are in the Islamic Republic of Iran, hacking, uh, you know, uh, d uh, issuing death penalties and uh, putting acid in women's faces, then there would be no natural no disaster. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is for crazy people in power. And Trump, that's they're good for you. you Warning can, for everybody. Your natural management can start praying now. Uh, and see uh, if it works. I, I think uh, it's not far off. I wouldn't put it beyond them. You should have a mission and and uh, compare how to stop natural disasters. No, maybe not. The wonderful slice of life this week is of uh, Afghan refugees who have started a cricket club in San Omar, which is very near Calais. And it is this heartwarming story where they started playing on concrete, uh, you know, uh, using a, a, a tennis ball as a makeshift cricket ball. And, you know, then being able to capture the imagination of the town, you've got a businessman in the area, then raising a little money for them to be able to establish a club and to be able to play in the town's sports center actually and people are now you know really yeah, taken with them and the french imagination has been captured by by the players and some of these people who fled afghanistan and it's just beautiful, you know, and, and some of those, the captain, uh, Jabad Ahmad Zai, says that he, he, he wanted to come to Britain and to play for a club, but he couldn't, he, start, he was stopped at Calais, now he's sought asylum in France and he's playing, now he's, he's, tra he, he's a builder now in his training to become an ambulance, ambulance driver. Yeah, yeah. That's a great loss to Britain, and I think that's a beauty. Where and a great win for France. For, and also, um, you know, the, um, you know the, the, the beauty of this is that when refugees and asylum seekers are you know, the, the image and the narrative is divorced from violence and sort of, you know, crime. And you see a, real humanity comes out. 
and they have formed a beautiful moment of life for this week. It's really beautiful indeed. It's so heartwarming and, you know, it's wonderful that they won their recent match and, uh, you know, we wish them the very best. We hope you've enjoyed this week's programme. We look forward to seeing you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo-breaking, free-thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.